Good morning, everyone. This is a, a session 17. It's devoted to um, data quality. Uh, we have five presentations. One of our speakers uh, couldn't be here. And so I will, uh, Chuck Peterson, so I'll deliver his presentation. And um, we hope to have about 15 minutes at the end to discuss aspects of data quality, uh, especially related to um, citizen science. Henry, why don't you take it away? Great. Hi, my name is Henry Engeldahl. I'm from the Botanic Garden in Mesa, and I'm going to be talking about her herbarium specimen label interpretation and transcription. These are just the first steps we've been taking um, with our data. So I'm going to fly through this rather quickly, but we had two digitization projects. Data cleaning, why was it necessary or is necessary, and steps taken using a number of fields, and then a quick conclusion. Right, so our first digitization project started in uh, 2015. We worked with an herbarium that was well curated, uh, and we did a lot of uh, preparation ourselves. The second one, uh, we started in 2018, um, approximately the same number of specimens, a little bit more. We reduced the preparation work because we found this was quite stressful on the staff, but we had uh, different sizes of specimens. Um, the system wasn't well curated. The system was much older, so we had much more legacy data, and there were also problems like multiple specimens per sheet. So we outsourced this to a company, Picture Ray, who then in turn uh, subcontracted a Lembo in Suriname to do the data transcription once the images were made. So this was all manually entered into the system. In that process, we drew up uh, lookup tables for things like collectors, country code. Um, we drew up a transcription protocol, and we also had a label interpretation document. So when they found things that were a little bit tricky to interpret, we would have comments. So there was that there. We had quality control done by Lembo. Then it went to Picture Ray. They did a subset. Uh, quality control, and then it came to Mesa, and then we checked it again. And if things weren't right, it got sent back and it had to be redone. So here is an example of some of the fields and uh, the number of things that have been changed, fields that have been changed since the project. Now, these numbers are actually quite large. And when I saw the data, it looked like somebody had taken a shotgun to the data set. So what went wrong? Well, virtually nothing went wrong. Everybody followed the data protocols correctly. They couldn't be faulted for the work they did. They actually delivered outstanding work. The number of blatant errors was minimal. The lookup tables were incomplete, but we knew that because we didn't know the collection. It was an unknown collection, so we expected that to, to be the case. The problem was largely due to the labels themselves. So the labels were often obscured by plant material. You can't blame somebody for not getting the whole label when they're dealing with a photograph. You can't see the label. So that was one of the problems. Another problem was labels were often illegible. Um, handwriting is, is quite variable. And we're talking about things that date from the 1800s. So uh, that was a large problem. So what were the sort of errors I was finding? Well, things like A's and O's, ones and sevens, U's and N's, W's and M's. These are the typical sort of things where people, when it's handwritten, get switched around and people uh, often battle to differentiate. Also, there was not consistency when it came to the sort of symbols using, to use a degree symbol or a number symbol. And that sort of variation uh, occurred. Some people knew a bit about German, so instead of using the SZ, they used the double S. So now two words that theoretically would be the same are now for a computer, two different words. Then we have a lot of accented characters because we have lots of different languages. And then sometimes the accents are included or you use an, the wrong accent or, yeah. So the variation there was quite, quite large. And then there was a small number of things where there were invisible uh, characters. So sometimes there was a tab in your in the export that we got from them, or invisible spaces, or line feeds, and that just messes things up. 
classics. People tend to sometimes swap things uh, around. So letters or numbers get switched around. This, this was quite a small number of things, but it occurs. Um, data was entered into the wrong field. We had fields. These were people who didn't always know the thing. So they make a guess as to which field it lands in, and it lands in the wrong field. So things like tax or collectors and places sometimes got mixed up. Uh, inconsistent data um, due to label transcription from an alphabet that's not your own. So where we are, for those of us who are just used to the Roman alphabet, the Cyrillic alphabet can be challenging and you could make wrong guesses. Um, this is not necessarily a problem that they had entering. Sometimes the labels we dealt with are labels that were already transcribed and stuck on the specimen. So it wasn't the original label that was on uh, the herbarium specimen. When you're dealing with really long uh, text strings, the order in which the information gets entered could also be variant, which means two records with identical information can actually be written in different orders. And that also created a problem. The use of different punctuation, you see something, people want to indicate that it's different. They use a comma, semicolon, colon, space, dash, underscore, and so it continues. So things that were potentially the same thing look different. Um, and sometimes the person who was encoding it was not familiar with the language, which, which meant that if they were, they would make fewer errors. So data cleaning. Um, collections comprise of little mini collections. A collector goes out as a collecting event, collects lots of different plants at the same place, so the collecting information is the same. Or uh, you have a collection, somebody gets lots of herbarium specimens from other people before they donated to us, they got information from the same collectors, which means that you can actually work out a lot of the errors by knowing who did they get their collections from. Uh, but the person transcribing this only sees one specimen at a time. When you get the whole data set to download, now you can compare things, you can group things that look similar. So data allows for comparison. To illustrate this, um, the first thing is to look at your data. You see obvious mistakes. You start ordering things. You start looking at graphs of how the data is, and certain things start popping up. So for example, here is collector uh, Charles Dalizet. And this is just a small section of the variations of his name. So here is a little graphic where I, on the x-axis, that represents a real person, and on the y-axis are all the variations on the person's name. It's a logarithmic scale, but as you can see, Lowell Ray had almost 240 variations on his name. And as you can see, uh, that's quite a number of things. So 55% of the specimens um, represent only 5% of the collectors. And 70% of our specimens were by 26 collectors. But then we have this really long tail of specimens that were only collected. They collected one or two specimens per collector. So that still needs to be sorted out. Looking at another field, country code, for example, 42% of these, the data that we had didn't have country assigned to it. This is not because they didn't write down the countries because the countries simply didn't occur on the specimen. With the remaining bit, well, we looked at them and we found that things that had S alien without lo uh, locality, we couldn't maybe fix that. And we used things like locality and country as given to try and work out what the country was. So um, in this thing, you can see there that 70% um, we attempted to do this by choosing keywords, et cetera. And so far we've cleaned 67% of those things. So we still got a little way to go, but a large portion has been cleaned. Other fields like collection are a problem and all this data gets resolved to that thing. And that's due, just due to standardization and normalization of the data, but it also contained two separate fields. So we had to actually pass these two things out as well. The steps taken for data cleaning is, first of all, look at your data. See what's there before you start throwing uh, difficult programs at it. Clean the obvious mistakes. Take out steps. Um, group things according to keywords. Uh, trim stuff. Take out all the spaces. Remove hidden characters. 
correct obvious spelling errors, and try and standardize symbols where possible. Standardize and normalize data in those fields that allow it. Uh, regroup the data and repeat. Use the data to clean the data. Uh, fields that have, um, for example, collector and country code can be used to clean other fields. So you use fields to clean other fields. Use external data if you have information, for example, on collector information, and you need to fill out the year. You can work out, oh, that person only collected, or only lived in the 1800s. You can fix those things. Or was the information before the person was born or after they died? We clearly have an error. So that's got to do with my uh, information here about uh, using um, uh, illogical data to, to, to figure out where the errors are. But using things like Open Refine, I found actually just crashed all the time because the data set was too large and uh, it was using a 10 pound hammer to crush a nut and you just line up with crush nuts. So um, I need to really stop. So the last <laughs> thing of the exercise is once we've got this, I find I will be able to now, once the data is a little bit cleaner, uh, use things like open refine to bring clarity to this. And then the last step is cleaning those long tails of information where uh, you have very little things to compare the data. And then these things have to be uh, verified one by one. Right, so I'm going to stop here. Otherwise, I think I'm going to be stoned. So um, yes, I'll allow everyone to just read those conclusions by themselves. But uh, thank you to... Uh, all these different people that have helped us in doing the project and helping clean the data. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. If someone wants to put something in the chat or speak up, that's great. I did see one question in the chat. Let's My see if I can. Can you share your conclusion? <laughs> Sorry, okay, I'll go back. Um, right, so first of all, if you can curate your collections first, it helps a lot because you know what's in your collection, you can set up little lookup tables, uh, etc. That definitely helps, and you can actually fix a lot of the problems before they arise. If they're well organized, that means you can infer a lot of information. Look at your data before you start, don't launch into big IT programs and start trying to clean it. It will just cause you a lot of panic and you can actually solve a lot of things very quickly because as human beings, we can visually see these errors quite, quite easily. Fix the obvious errors first and you'll find this very blurry picture starts actually coming into focus. Um, identify logical areas. That's at a later stage. That's when you start using other fields to validate other fields. Uh, etc., uh, and allow sufficient time for data cleaning. People do these projects, they get this data set, and then people say, why isn't the data online? You go, yeah, because it's messy. And they, and they go, but why is it messy? We, you know, it's all been entered. And you go, no, actually, you need to look at it in detail. People didn't make errors, but there are gaps that need to be filled before you start out online. Um, I did launch a set once under protest. And within 24 hours, I got a report from Sunday online saying, I found all these errors in your data. And I go, I know they exist. And they said, well, why didn't you clean them up? And I go, because it will take the next 10 years. Um, so people need more understanding that actually it takes time to clean these things. And it is a long process and an iterative process. All right, thank you very much. That uh, helps uh, give an overview of, of your advice. And obviously that will be useful in the long term for many people because there's still lots of cleaning efforts going on. And that leads us to our next speaker, Alex uh, Zika, is that pr pronounced correctly? I'm not sure. Anyway, Ziska. Ziska, there we go, yes. thank you. And um, he's gonna talk some more about filtering and in particular, uh, the title of his talk is uh, automated filtering may remove a large fraction of records but may have little impact on downstream analyses. Take it away, Alex. Okay, thanks. Oh, I can't share my screen because the host has blocked it, it says. So uh, the conference track should jump in here and fix that for you.
Uh, yes, now it's working. Okay, can you see my presentation? We can. Excellent. Um, so I'll just start. Uh, well, thank you again for the introduction. It's great to be part of the conference, uh, although if it's only virtually. It's also really great to follow up on Henry. Um, yeah, but step by step. So I'm telling no news if I'm saying that all, the availability of all kinds of biodiversity data have increased massively in the last decades. This, of course, includes all kinds of different data, but I'll focus today on species distribution uh, information. Um, and this data has, of course, massively increased because of the massive efforts of um, the data aggregators and, and uh, uh, data contributors. And I'm just showing some of the biggest here as an example, but really, as you all know, there are much more. And this has, of course, been facilitated uh, a lot by the efforts of the Tedwick community. And these records are great. They have transformed in many ways uh, the way how we do uh, ecology or biodiversity research and conservation research and have also kicked off wholly new fields like macroecology and macroevolution where large data sets of many species are analyzed at the same time to understand global uh, shared patterns so it's a fantastic resource but as you also all know and hence also in the title of the symposium they have a lot of challenges um and um yes so i, I i'll give some examples here related to the geographic occurrence of species, and those are common recurrence, typical errors that occur in these composed databases. So this is just an example, the distribution of a plant genus in, uh, in South America. And for those not familiar with South America, so Sophia is more or less up here, right? So for a variety of reasons, mostly because these data sets are uh, collected at different times by different people with different methodology, and then at a later stage combined, uh, and partly also because of the many things that Henry has just shown us, there are a set of recurrent errors that occur over and over again regarding these coordinates. And there are some examples listed here on the left side. They include zero coordinates, for example, where the coordinates for some reason, one of them has been set to zero. So we'll often see higher diversity along the equator um, but they also include more sophisticated things, such as records that are um, put on the place of a biodiversity institution, be it through citizen science because it's a zoo and somebody took a picture of a lion somewhere in South America, or maybe because for some reason the physical place of the specimen has been put as location of the specimen. So they're different type of these errors. Um, and just to show that they're a real problem, an example from a case study um, that was led by Carla de Maldonado a few years ago, where it compared just species richness patterns emerging from a verified data set where Carla traveled uh, along South America, different herbaria, collected information of one um, species of Rubiaceae in the coffee family, uh, Cinchona, and uh, spent six uh, months of her life to compile this spatial distribution information and compare that to a GBIF data set, which uh, we obtained in, in 20 or 30 minutes. What we did then was to, for both data sets, to infer species richness in a 100 by 100 kilometer grid, and then uh, subtract the GBIF information from the expert verified data. And you can see the result here on the right side in the big map with the colorful dots. Each dot is a raster cell, and uh, the color showed the difference among the two data sets. And you can see, or one thing you can see is that there are little, many little red dots where the GBIF data set massively overestimated the number of species. So as maximum, it had 25 more species in one cell. And this was a total of about 120 species, right? And as we looked into that more, turned out all these little dots that are circled here are country centroids, right? And what happened is that from a rough locality description or maybe a label that was hard to reach, some automated georeferencing took place and referenced the record to the center of this country, um, for example, Brazil. And this of course is, can be very problematic because it's very imprecise in many cases. So from this experience, uh, we developed, um, the software package is called Coordinate Cleaner, and this is some shameless uh, advertisement now, but it's basically a, a, an R package, which in a very simple way 
gives, gives people the opportunity for any data set with geographic occurrences to identify records that are potentially problematic with regard on these relatively simple errors that I've just shown some examples of. And it does so by uh, first some intrinsic data tests, um, as Henry just suggested also. So these zero coordinates are one example for that, but also mostly by comparing the coordinates with external gazetteers. So for example, to identify records that fall on country centres, on the capitals, or on the location of biodiversity institutions. And it's super simple to use. So with this basically one line on co of code that you can see here on the right side, you can test your data set for all these issues and identify um, those that are potentially problematic. And um, we've run that at that time, 2019, for all flowering plant records that were available from GBIF at this time, and found that out of these 90 millions, about 3.3 million were flagged. Um, and you can see here on this map, uh, basically the number of records that were flagged. One thing that pops out is this zero, zero island of the coast of Africa, where the coordinates are zero, zero. Um, but you could also, for example, see um, uh, the equator here. Uh, so these are all records that were flagged. And uh, really, um, Coordinate Cleaner was just one of them. There are multiple tools that function in a similar way. For example, there's this relatively new one, BDC, which has been awarded the shared first prize of the GBIF Evan Nielsen uh, challenge this year. So uh, there's a huge need, of course, trying to identify these potentially problematic records. And the idea that we initially had was uh, that we can use this tool to identify the potentially problematic records and then go look at them in detail and um, correct them. But turns out this is not how this is often used because this is often used for large data sets. What, what happens is that those records identified as potentially problematic are just filtered out for downstream analysis, um, which may or may not be a good idea. So for this talk, I wanna address two questions with regard to that. The first one is, what is the importance of these different individual flags, or to say it uh, differently, what is the most important type of error that occurs? And the second one is, what is the effect on an example of a downstream analysis? So to address the first question, uh, I'll refer to another case study where what we did was basically we collected um, a, a different taxonomic specialist from a large variety of different taxa uh, from South America in 2018 in Natal, and then downloaded all data available from these different groups. And uh, yeah, basically it's written here, 219,000 records and used coordinate cleaner to on all of these groups, seeing which records it would flag, and then let the taxonomic um, specialists um, have a look at that and give their opinion. Um, take a good look at this very um, pretty picture of the different uh, groups we used, because unfortunately the main results I'll show are in this table now. <laughs> um, uh, so this is a bit complex, but actually it's not, and I'll try to walk you through it step by step. So what you can see in the rows is basically the different taxa that we had in the study. They're also illustrated by the little phylopix uh, before the first row. And in the columns, we have in the first five, uh, five columns, we have summary, and then we have in each column the proportion of records that was flagged by individual tests. So I'll just now try and highlight the most important things that we took home from this. The first one is the proportion of records flagged by one test or another was really high. So it was ranged between 25 to almost 90% uh, for different taxonomic groups. Um, and this is also congruent with other studies from other people all over the world, where usually about 10 to 20% of records are retained after thorough cleaning. However, from these flags we showed here, a much lower proportion did we actually consider as truly erroneous or problematic, whereas the rest was more um, 
unfit for most downstream analysis. So um, if we look a bit more detail in what we consider true errors, this one, basically those records that were located at biodiversity institutions, those that had zero coordinates, and this was, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but it's the third column in the box here was very low. And then those coordinates, and this is uh, the, uh, the literal oak in the sea, those that were flagged as sea or land, uh, where they should probably not be. And there are directly two things that uh, strike out here and that I want to mention as a major take home message. And this is that the cleaning needs to be adapted to the taxonomic group because this upper group here with the 44% of records flagged is actually a group of hermit crabs. So it's not surprising that a lot of them are on the border between sea and land, right? So this is not necessarily an error. Then um, the couple of more records that are potentially could be considered unfit. Um, for example, those that are political centroids, which may or may not be enough precision depending on what your analysis is. For a continental scale analysis, those may be fine. But for example, for a raster scale analysis, they may not be. Good. So the different flags, different results for different taxa need to be adapted. What's the effect or the implication for downstream analysis? The example I want to here quickly use for downstream analysis is the IUCN red list, um, which is a, a major policy tool to identify species as threatened with extinction based on a set of standardized criteria. Our species are classified in categories from critical and danger to least concern, um, basically. It's a fantastic tool, high, high impact, of, of course, but it has a problem. It is taxonomically very biased. It's mostly Vertebrate species are assessed, mostly plants and invertebrates are not. So all this conservation effort is based on a, on a small fraction of, uh, of taxa of biodiversity. So one thing approach people take is, okay, we can use big database of species occurrence to the rescue here, because one of the ICN criteria, criterion B, uses range size um, to estimate the extinction risk. So what is basically done, two metrics are calculated, the extent of occurrence, which is a convex hull polygon around um, occurrences, and the area of occupancy, which is the sum of raster cells that species occur. So we did run these analysis calculating these automatic indices for those groups that also had IUCN assessments and compared them. What we found was that we found a massive change in these indices in the cleaned versus the raw data, which is what you would expect if you take points away, the convex hull gets smaller, the AO gets smaller. But this did not translate in any difference in the match of the actual estimate of extinction risk categories. So they were the same, more or less on the left side. This is the raw data and on the filtered data. So no impact here of these errors, which takes me straight to the summary. What can we take out of this? So I think automated flagging can really be a useful tool to help identify problematic records, but it needs to be adapted for the, the taxa of interest, basically. And um, IUCN automated rest, red listing seems to be relatively robust, robust to these problems. Um, so the main thing I take from this is be optimistic, right? So the GBIF mediated data or large data sets are actually much better than they often get credit for, I think, despite the obvious errors. And with that, I wanna thank you for your attention, all the people institutions that put the effort in making this data available and all the people that were involved in these studies that I just showed. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. That was a very interesting and a nice summary of some problems that we all face. And uh, I'm sure that uh, I would use your R package uh, to try to clean data and use it to teach people about um, the, what you can do, what, what options you have since R is such a standard tool now. Yes. Um, we're uh, we're uh, out of time for questions, but we can return when, um, when uh, we have time at the end of the session. Um, I'm going to present uh, Chuck Peterson's presentation. So if I can have uh, the ability to share a screen, I will uh, uh, 
do my best to uh, talk about his work. Okay, uh, let's see if I can do that. Yep. There we go. And let's see. Is that working for people? Can people see that? Yes. All right. Very good. Um, I see things coming and going now. Are we okay? I can't see you yet, so you need to share your screen. I didn't hear for sure that people can see the screen. Is, no, we, okay? we don't see it now. Earlier we saw it. Okay. Let me uh, see um, what's going on. I'm going to try to share screen again. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. I'm going to try to start the slideshow and that should work. How about yes. that? Yes. Okay. All right. Sorry for that glitch. Um, uh, Chuck Peterson unfortunately had uh, issues with his uh, family responsibilities, so I've uh, uh, taken the responsibility of talking about uh, his uh, project. Um, he is uh, has a herpetology lab in Idaho, um, the state of Idaho in the U.S., uh, where for many years he's uh, been involved in a, a biodiversity of amphibians and reptiles in the state. Um, this is the overall uh, organization of the uh, project. Th there's a state wildlife action plan, and this goes back uh, at least 20 years to the um, time when the GAP project, some of you may have heard of that, which was an uh, idea actually started in Idaho by the uh, Forest Service to, um, to document biodiversity. Um, and he became involved in, in acquiring data and helping people um, uh, identify uh, locations uh, which were important for conserving biodiversity. Um, and so it's just identify the need, acquire data, um, and then summarize data, and finally analyze and apply the data. Um, and Idaho was divided up into these hexagonal, hexagonal tiles. And so this was all done in cooperation with many other parties, including uh, NatureServe. Um, the specimens for this project come from museum uh, records, from uh, surveys by scientists, and then by contributed observations, either traditional or crowdsourced. And not surprisingly, um, it's iNaturalist that has become very important. And here's his. Uh, a uh, graphic to uh, describe the uh, process of um, gathering data, uh, apps and guides, make the observation using iNaturalist. Uh, so he's acknowledging uh, um, Cal Academy and, and National Geographic who support iNaturalist. Um, then uh, what's important that I'll emphasize in this talk for Chuck is this verification step but then very interestingly, um, the data gets harvested. Uh, this is not common, but Idaho Fish and Wildlife Information Systems have software that harvests the data uh, uh, um, very regularly in which it, it can be then uh, incorporated on, in an automatic way into the planning process within the state and other people. Okay, so I think that's a, another step that I'll talk a little bit more, bring that, bring that into focus for people. Um, this uh, is the uh, an initial um, summary from iNaturalist. Uh, there were 4, 000, uh, over 4,500 uh, observations on iNaturalist and 1,800 other observations from museum and professional surveys. 
Um, they've done an extensive job gathering this information over many years. So they've they've talked to people who scientists who made the collections, got the original data. So that's a very complete um, number there, 1800. Um, and just in the last six months or so, you can see that iNaturalist has grown uh, the the data set. It's uh, almost up by a thousand observations. They got another species and. Uh, another more than 200 people are involved. So it's a growing enterprise as I think most of us are aware iNaturalist is, continues to grow and contribute to biodiversity uh, studies. Um, there are uh, um, now uh, only about, uh, well, the, the important thing is the data quality and here is the data review uh, process. And what is involved is that Chuck and his graduate students, plus other citizens in the in the state, uh, have I have I been identified as experts, are able to review the um, the data that comes in, and there are two important uh, observations about that. There are only forty species of amphibians and reptiles, so there's not a large number, and it's relatively easy to take photographs or to get recordings. Um, so that means that um, they're able to confirm or correct the identification of over 93% of the contributed observations. So a large fraction of the data can be used. Um, and um, what they're also able to show is that, that the um, rate of misidentification for research grade, uh, that's always a big concern for people who are familiar with iNaturalist because of the social um, social uh, inertia to, to uh, like or to agree with an identification that's already there, but they're, they're able to go back in and review these data and find that there's a very low rate of misidentification, uh, only, only 2%, I think. So that's good news uh, for this tax, taxonomic group. It means that uh, even without this expert review, there, you would get a uh, high quality data. Um, furthermore, uh, uh, they can um, confirm our, uh, our correct observations uh, as, cur as curator reviewed. So that's a step that most of us aren't familiar with, but that is the way that the Idaho Department of Fish and Game can harvest the data and incorporate it, the data into their state species diversity database. Uh, and for those unfamiliar with how the system works in the US, um, the NatureServe, which was part of the Nature Conservancy, but broke off maybe 15 years ago and handles most of the uh, data, uh, rare and endangered species data in the US and, and has a larger global presence, of course, too. But each state has a natural heritage database and that's what we're talking about here. This, this uh, data goes into that database. Uh, and then these data can be used to determine species status and trends for the state wildlife action plan um, and uh, therefore inform management of, of uh, what, what priorities they might have. Um, just so uh, people can understand a little bit more about how these data get used, I've incorporated a few more of Chuck's slides here. Um, and um, what uh, this depends on is this occupancy framework. Um, so uh, here are the number of um, uh, octagon or hexagons in the state, 305.99. So the first question is, has it been previous sampling? Is it historically present? Then is it uh, currently sampled? Is it uh, 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 currently present? And then is there a trend classification? And then they give a color. Uh, so present, declined, unknown, increase, unoccupied, unknown, increase, unoccupied, and unknown. So they have a, a very well worked out logic to, um, to imply the status of biodiversity that's based on this occupancy status that may be familiar to people, but I think it's worthy worth reviewing. Um, and uh, one of the things that I uh, they've analyzed here is the spatial uh, variability. 
so that they can understand that. They've also uh, tried to account for where uh, people are sampling. Uh, that was a thesis done in Chuck's lab. And the interesting thing is that um, they could look at the number of observations, ecological influences, and social influences. We all know that biodiversity depends on social uh, aspects. And one of the things that's significant down here is the number of people. Uh, and then the, the human habitat index, human population, also recruitment. Uh, over the years, Chuck has gone around the state and given lectures about iNaturalist, and that has greatly improved the, the uh, knowledge uh, about the project and recruited people who've become um, uh, very committed to helping gather data. Um, they can then go and rank species 2005, 2015, and now they're going for 2025. Here's an example from the Northern Leopard Frog. And this is just uh, for people to go back and look if they care. But what you can see here is the sources of data uh, were initially museum, and then eventually they've become uh, a combination. Post 2000 has got a lot more observations from iNaturalist and other surveys, okay? Um, and he ends by, uh, talking about the uh, analysis of, of data, in particular, the challenges of using unstructured crowdsourced data, the lack of, uh, lack of sampling design, uneven coverage across space and time in the absence of negative data, which makes it hard to quantify observation effort. Of course, we're all familiar with the effort challenge. Um, and I will stop here. Um, just to talk about the sampling effort, but I'll just finish this here by uh, saying that there have been lots of contributors over time. Chuck has reached out to many partners and that although he wasn't able to be here today, he welcomes any questions you might have. Um, and it's hard to see uh, down here, but it's uh, pchar at um, isu.edu. Uh, and if for some reason you that doesn't come out for you, I'm very happy to put you in touch with him. So with that, I'll stop. And we have a couple minutes if people have any questions. Thank you. No questions in the in-person audience, but we've got very little time before the next one. Perhaps we should move on to the next session. Since we're since we're quiet, why don't I uh, um, just introduce Mike Dodd? Um, this is a different platform than iNaturalist. It's iSpot. Uh, so this is uh, used in the British Isles. Um, Mike Dodd is going to tell us about uh, their experiences curating data. The title of his talk is How Citizen Science Platform iSpot Ensures Data Accuracy During and After Collection. Michael, take it away. OK, thank you. Um, is this going to come up? Can you see my screen? It looks good, thank you. Okay, okay so um, uh, thank you. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk about that as, as, as you said. Um, so iSpot is, is similar to iNAT, um, similar time scale. Um, it's um, UK and global. Um, the, the idea was to lower barriers to identification and build identification skills, um, but it was also set up so it collects um, biological records. Um, I'll zoom through that. Um, so on iSpot, anyone can enter an observation, um, but the, the, the main part about it is it has a reputation system so that um, 
you can one person can enter identification and then other people can and the identification that becomes likely is dependent on the reputation of the person who entered it plus the reputation or the of the people who agree with that particular um uh, name so um it, it, it is this reputation system that that, that um gives the the identification and users gain reputation by entering uh, observations uh, by entering identifications which others uh, agree with and those if those other people if they have existing reputation then the one who's gaining it um uh, gains that um and th and so that that makes the observation become um likely and it, it, it increases the reputation of the person who has made the identification um, as well so the accuracy of the system has been checked um, so this was done some years ago um, a previous curator to myself um, sent in about forty-eight thousand records from iSpot into the uk national verification system which is called iRecord and on there, um, um, we can see that um, of the 48,000 records so far, uh, 20, well, 20 and a half thousand records have been accepted as, as verified records. Um, a, a small number have been queried um, and some have been rejected. Um, and I get notifications of, of all these coming through. Um, but, but it, so the first things are interesting about this. One is it's clear it takes a very long time for records to become um, uh, verified through, through the standard system. I mean, th these were sent in, as I say, six or seven years ago. And so far, well, less than half have come, come back and been uh, verified. Um, and of those rejected records, um, it's often the, the, the expert thinks it perhaps should be um, classified at a higher level, so not species at genus level or family level or whatever. Uh, and in a few cases, the expert themselves is, is wrong. Um, so if, if we're looking at about um, the observer ex expertise, um, so you can see um, on the right hand side, the, the so you can look at any person on iSpot and you can see their reputation. So it's divided into um, different groups or organisms. You can see their reputation, how many observations they've put up, how many identifications they've made, how many uh, um, people have agreed with them and how, how many times they've agreed with others. And you can also see their social interactions. Um, so uh, the, the observer ex expertise themselves, the one who posts the observation, that's less relevant uh, on iSpot than perhaps on some other systems because you know the name is being um, checked by this reputation system itself. But the observer still has to give accurate location, accurate time, and provide good, good images. And the community um, of people on iSpot give feedback on these aspects. Okay, so talking about the community, um, the, the community also gives um, advice on, on how to um, take uh, suitable images. So, so the, the, there's advice on the system itself, but also the, the, the community will often um, tell the person who's put up an image that it needs that needs to be more information. I mean, for example, um, this is more, more of an issue in certain groups and organisms than others. With fungi, for example, at least two images uh, are almost always needed. Um, some members of the community um, provide exemplar um, observations with many different uh, images. For example, here, here, here's one um, showing the, the twigs, the pollen, the reproductive structures. Um, so this is done for many uh, different groups of organisms, and it's done by the community, so, so that they uh, take this on themselves. Okay, so I've been recently looking at, um, well, I've been looking at this throughout the whole time, but, but, but um, for this talk, looking at the spatial accuracy, I mean, we heard about some of these things earlier on. Um, so what I did here was compared the coordinates that the person had given with the, the name of the place. So I did, I looked at about 1000 uh, observations, 
and of these, um, you see most of them were within two miles of, of the, the, the name. Um, some of them were ambiguous because in, in Britain, the same name of the place can apply to many places across the country. Um, so there, there are many different reasons. When I think one of the earlier person mentioned some of these reasons, um, why it may be wrong, missing out minor sign in front of the coordinates, um, or wrong place the mouse mouse point or whatever. Um, but anyway, I looked at um, some of the ones that were more than two uh, miles away, and um, th this is this is the map. This is, th these are these are the ones. Um, and so the red dots are from the coordinates, and the green dots are from the place name. Um, and there's a, an obvious cluster in southwest Scotland. Uh, so, yeah, um, and that, that's a known issue uh, about the reading of coordinates from images by the system. So we, 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 know, we know, know about that. I haven't had to fix it, but we know, it, know about it. Um, and of the others, they are just made by very few users. Um, and some of those users um, make lots of good observations, but obviously they do, do make a few mistakes as well. Um, and the final point I might make here that, that um, when the, those 48,000 records were checked, um, almost none had any mention of whether the location was correct or not. So there's a question about whether that's, those are being checked. Uh, then temporal accuracy. Um, so many uh, observations on iSpot are not from mobile phones. They, they, they are other, other ways of getting data in. Um, so the system obviously checks the record. It, it records when the, when the observation is put up. Um, but we also specifically asked for when the observation was made. Um, and it, it, uh, we've not done a huge amount of checking that, but from the phonology, from the image aspects and things, it, it seems quite rare that anything is wrong about the, the date when you, are, when you ask for, for the people to, to put it in. Um, occasionally it's wrong, but, but very occasionally. Um, one, one issue with these, these systems is that um, there are some older dates. You know, people do go back through their, their record sheets, their, their, their image collections, and put in older dates. And some of these older dates, um, systems have problems with. Um, and I, I shared this particular image here because I looked, did a filter for those um, observations before 1980. And some of those are correct, and some of them are not correct. Um, and this is simply the, the system itself, as, as the filter, has, has not worked correctly. So. The dates of the observations are right, but this, the, the software hasn't, has, has made a mistake. Okay, so um, I'm a curator, so I'm, I'm checking it many times. Um, so I, I looked at those 48,000 observations which were sent into iRecord all those years ago, and I compared a download of those, which I did recently, with the original data that was sent in. And um, you, you know it should be the same. You know, data should be the same, um, and it wasn't. And um, to, to kind of long short story short, that, that, that there were some very small errors, and they were due to changes in coordinate systems and um, the way that the, the, the systems handle dates. So um, a sort of a side effect of this is that um, some observations appear one day differently on the two systems. Um, so I'm just saying it's very important to check the data every time you move it between systems because it, you, should, you, think, you think it's all the same, but actually it may not be. Um, and uh, particularly with, with these citizen science systems that, that um, the data takes on life of its own. Um, people go back and check old, old record and, 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 and make, make changes. Whereas when it's on the, the, the um, when it's on iRecord, it's, it's sort of fixed. So, um, the, the data sets diverge over time. Uh, and this, this is a, it, these are examples of the community um, getting involved. They get involved in making identifications and agreements, but they also run projects for tax, taxonomic groups or different, different areas. And they go back and check many, many um, of the observations, all of the observations, if, if possible, from those different groups to make sure the data is good. So. Um, there's the community doing this, and and the community and the curator um, obviously gets involved in this as well. 
So in summary, um, there are several approaches to showing, showing data accuracy. The reputation system, a very active user community and um, creation by an experienced ecologist. Um, these are some of the other system science uh, pro projects we also have at the Open University. I point to the middle one, the Treezilla, which has uh, a million trees or so on it. Um, and it has obviously a number of the similar issues to, to, to iSpot, that, that data. And here's my contact details. Thank you. I rushed through that very quickly. I'm not sure if I, the time is, time is right or not, but anyway, there we are. You've done a good job. That gives time for questions. Um, often there's exciting work being done in the British Isles with biodiversity. And uh, maybe someone has a question. If not, I have a question. Do you know if a, a record system supports um, the iRecord system supports provenance? So the idea you were talking about of things getting updated and and it not necessarily being checked or known. Um, well, well, so, so the, the idea would be that um, data go well. Um, data from my spot would would go to to NBN, the national UK national system, and then onto GB. And and in in those instances, I think the whole data set is moved, so mm -hmm. so that um, the, the 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 changes that the community have made would then be you know corrections they've made would then eventually get get onto the main system. Um, that I'm not sure if that's the case with the with iRecord though. So um yeah that, that, that that's why i'm saying that those data sets tend to diverge over time because mm -hmm. the community is always active looking back and, and doing other things could you say a little bit more about iRecord and how that's supported and what that actually entails that 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 is the sort of the uk national system where the experts verify data so that um Often that 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 is um, people sending in sheets of data, you know, Excel spreadsheets or whatever. So so that, that it covers all taxonomic groups, mm -hmm. and so um, those experts are incredibly overworked. I mean, they they are the top experts, and they they are verifying the data. They're, they're saying this is real, proper. They're supposed to check every aspect of it, but in, um, that's, that's an enormous task, <laughs> checking basically all all biodiversity data. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. All right. Well, thank you for that uh, uh, overview of iSpot and uh, some of the other project. Learning about some of the other projects is exciting for me that are going on at the Open University. Um, let's uh, get ready for our our uh, last presentation. That's going to be from Jessica Allen. And let me uh, let me just. Um, introduce her. Uh, Jessica um, is going to talk about um, a group um, that can be taxonomically difficult, but we know that is ecologically very relevant, and that's lichens. Lichens have been shown to, to uh, be good indicators of uh, ecological health, and um, they're easy to observe. They don't move, so the degree to which we can identify them correctly will help us um, uh, uh, in our in our uh, action and planning. The title of her talk is Assessing Identification Accuracy of Research-Grade iNaturalist Observations in Lichens and Other Taxonomically Difficult Organisms. Jessica, please uh, start your presentation. Hi, thank you, Rob, and thank you so much for inviting me to this symposium. And I've just I've learned a lot already from all of the presenters here. Um, so uh, I definitely uh, am looking forward to questions and feedback as well on my project here. So um, I worked on this project with Troy McMullen, a scientist at the Canadian Museum of Nature, and we're both lichenologists. And I think quickly you'll see why we were motivated to. Um, to take on this project. And everybody, can everybody see my slides, Rob? Can you yes, yes, it's, it's working just fine. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you. 
Okay, so um, as we've been discussing in this symposium so far, uh, it's really important for many reasons for us to have a um, as good of an understanding as possible of where species exist on this planet. So species distribution data is super important. Um, and we have this fantastic platform, iNaturalist, um, to help with uh, community science efforts to gather those data, right? So at the time that I took this screenshot a couple of weeks ago, uh, there were 116 million observations on iNaturalist. That's incredible. As you all know, there are these great projects as well. There's one ongoing with this uh, particular conference. Uh, and there are some of these really high profile discoveries that we've seen come out of the iNaturalist program, like this um, observation of this particular snail for the first time in over 100 years in Vietnam. Now, um, some iNaturalist observations are aggregated by GBIF. So these research grade observations that have two additional people confirm the identification um, end up being automatically aggregated by GBIF. And again, um, as of a few weeks ago, we were looking at about 50 million observations in GBIF from iNaturalist. And you can see the taxonomic distribution of those data on the right. And actually fungi are the small pink sliver there um, in that pie chart. So let's take a look at an example of a species. This is the common green shield lichen, Flavoparmelia caparata, very abundant, um, widely distributed. And um, if we wanted to look at how many observations um, came from iNaturalist and were integrated into GBIF and compare that to the number of herbarium specimens, um, if you click that number of occurrences, uh, and then advanced and then come down to basis of record, we see 33,000 human observations versus 13,000 herbarium specimens. Um, so actually most of the occurrence data for this species comes from iNaturalist. Um, so there's some pros and cons here, right? So, I mean, it's fantastic to have that many observ more observations of the species compared to, you know, the person power it takes to generate those 13,000 herbarium records. On the other hand, um, the question remains as to how many of these observations are actually correct. And that is what we wanted to know when we took this project on. So um, we had this larger question, how accurate are research grade observation identifications on iNaturalist for taxonomically difficult organisms? And we define taxonomically difficult organisms sort of in two categories that actually are very much overlapping often. So those would be organisms that are undergoing frequent and large scale taxonomic revisions um, and also groups of organisms that require some sort of specialized knowledge or specialized techniques for identification. So um, some extra level of knowledge, whether that's knowing that, for instance, with an insect that you need a photograph of the wing venation um, or for groups of organisms that require some level of microscopy or compound microscopy. So we saw, for instance, um, in Idaho with the amphibian and reptiles, there was a less than less than two percent misidentification. Um, we guessed that the level of misidentification would be higher for some other groups of organisms. <laughs> um, and as Robert um, mentioned, uh, you know, just a quick introduction to lichens. I'm guessing most people know what they are. Um, but just in case you don't, these are symbiotic organisms. They're symbioses that form between fungi and green algae and or cyanobacteria. Um, there are over 20,000 named species of lichenized fungi, and they occur in every single ecosystem on this planet. They are beautiful and diverse. Okay, so we refined this question um, because Troy and I are lichenologists. So you know, we could we could go into iNaturalist and actually assess the accuracy of these lichen observations. And we divided the um, observations into four groups or species into four groups. So we took a group of species that should be identifiable based just on um, 
cell phone photographs, good cell phone photographs. So that's kind of our macroscopic group. Um, we looked at species that require extra steps. So species that require some chemical test for accurate identification. We had a group of species that require some level of compound microscopy for identification. And then we also looked at all species of lichens that are federally protected in Canada and the United States. So those are our rare and threatened species. Okay, so we took species that fell into each of these categories. And then um, we looked at up to 50 research grade observations for each species in each of the categories. In some cases, we had fewer than 50 research grade observations to work with. Um, but that's noted uh, throughout the results. And we ended up looking at 32 species. Now, when we looked at those observations and their identification, we would group each observation into one of three categories. <coughs> First, is the identification accurate? Second, is it actually not possible to determine the accuracy of that observation given the data? And then third are those observations, are the, is the identification actually inaccurate? Okay, so diving right into the results here. So I'll start with um, species that fell into that first category, species that um, with good cell phone pictures, we should be able to identify them accurately. So here are the five species that we looked at um, and the Colors on these bars indicate which of those categories they fell into. So the darker blue, the bottom most quadrant there, um, those were observations whose identification were accurate. And just as a reminder, these are only research grade observations. The gray indicates observations that cannot be confidently confirmed. And then the light blue uh, are observations that were incorrectly identified. So we have accurate identifications ranging from 20 to 85%. Um, the species in the middle there, Parmelia squarosa, requires a good photograph of the underside of the lichen, of the particular structure called rhizines. Um, so most observations didn't actually have a photograph of that characteristic. Um, and then of course, there's some inaccuracy there. So. Let's take a closer look at Flavoparmelia caparata, which I was talking about in our introduction. All right, so we have 70% of what of those observations are accurately identified. So if we come back to this page on GBIF and say, okay, 33,000 or so of these records are from human observations from iNaturalist, and somewhere between 14 to 30% of those are. Um, incorrect, correct. Um, we're looking at about 4,700 to 10,000 of those observations being incorrectly identified, which is a lot. Okay, on to these other categories. So here are the species we looked at that require some um, compound microscopy for identification. Usually this has to do uh, with spore characteristics. Um, and in this case, we see that most the vast majority of these observations uh, don't include appropriate um, characteristics either in the comments or in the photographs for identification. There are a handful that um, did include the correct information, but for the most part, um, these were not a, we were not able to accurately identify those. And then the same story uh, for when we're looking at species that require some sort of chemical test, right? So, um, the vast majority, again, aren't uh, verifiable essentially. And again, just as a reminder, these are all research grade observations. Okay, so how about the rare species, threatened species? Um, you'll see here that the identification accuracy is actually quite high for many of them. And we hypothesize there are a few reasons for this. Um, it could be that the people who are going out and looking for these species actually are, know what they're looking for. They have that target in mind. They already have like a fairly strong background in lichenology. Um, so they're either the there's some um, sort of there are some observers out there 
uh, who have more likened skills. Also, it could be that the people who are going to identify these species on the iNaturals platform um, are have a you know keen eye out for rare and threatened species and are being very careful about the identification. There are also a lot of resources out there, um, documents that have include a great deal of information um, about all these species. So it's easy to find information about all of these rare and threatened species as well. So um, I thought this was actually kind of encouraging when we're thinking about the conservation implications. So uh, Troy and I published these data uh, in, a, in a paper this past year. Um, it is available online. And as part of that, we include some suggestions at various levels to increase the accuracy of these observations. We have suggestions for making better posts, um, including things like recording what species are growing on, microscopic or imi microscopic images, information on chemical tests, um, avoiding immature individuals. Uh, we have a suite of suggestions for either identi for identifying species, um, whether it's a person's own post or commenting on posts from other people. Um, the machine learning generated identifications on iNaturalist are not very accurate for lichens. Uh, we would certainly recommend not relying very heavily on that. Uh, we would recommend that species that observations be identified to genus only if people can't choose a species. So if you don't have that chemical or microscopic data, just leave it at genus. Um, other suggestions like commenting on observations rather than just changing this, you know, putting in a new species name if we're not sure, things like this. And then um, finally, uh, this perspective, this um, you know, thinking about using those data and how we can, as kind of a research community, improve the quality of these data. You know, this this set of recommendations is probably most relevant to this audience. Um, at this point, um, I personally would not use observation data on from GBIF for lichens based on the level of accuracy of those data. Um, Clearly, I think some data curation would be really helpful and maybe even consider limiting aggregation of data into GBIF for organisms or species groups that um, we just, we know that the data are not great. Um, and then, you know, I would say there, I think this is a, a great area for discussion. I really enjoyed um, the presentation on iSpot. It sounds like maybe we have uh, some lessons to learn from that platform for increasing our accuracy here on iNaturalist as well. Okay, so thank you again for the invitation to speak in this symposium. Um, I'd like to acknowledge both Paul Sokoloff and Niels Van Miltenberg who um, helped us gather these data. And I'm happy to take questions if I have some time. Thank you very much. There's time for questions and we can lead into a, a period of discussion. Um, Thank you, Jessica. Um, my name's Arthur Chapman. Uh, I think a lot of your conclusions there apply to just about everything on iNaturalist. It does just um, use the automated AI system. It works for birds in some areas, for example, but I noticed in Australia for plants, it doesn't work very well at all. Um, and the other information, taking bright light and all those sorts of things, I think applies to, to everything. So it's very interesting that your conclusion is there not to, basically not to um, aggregate it and send it to GBIF. And I would fully support your suggestion that you only uh, identify to genus unless you're 100% or at least 95% accurate. Uh, and, and I think that applies to all taxa. 
Yes, I thank you for that comment. Um, I certainly, yeah, I I would agree that there are issues with all groups of organisms with these data, um, and you know chose to, chose to comment on the group of organisms that um, I have the expertise to assess very carefully. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Jessica. This is Cecilia from the Chief of Secretariat. I have another question. Um, I was thinking about whether you looked at the observers for the different groups. I could see some of the groups or some of the tags that had very little records. Mm -hmm. Did you look into how many of these were, were identified by the same people? Yeah, so we didn't. So we did um, discuss that. And note that as we were going, this is a really interesting question. Um, the ob I would say the observations came from a wide diversity of people. Um, there were a few instances where specific identifiers seemed to be driving that research grade, um, you know, getting that getting those observations up to that research grade level. Um, and though there were some really specific people that were popping up quite a bit. Um, and I think the, the, it's, it is a good question because then you have this um, situation where you can reach out to those specific people and maybe communicate to them that it's maybe not the best idea to continue to agree on observations when there isn't enough data to do that. Um, so yeah, that's certainly that social aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, thanks for a great talk. Vince Smith, NHM London. Um, one of the problems I regularly find on iNaturalist is people are a, a sort of over-specifying to a sort of over degree of granularity, if you like, their identification. So I get asked to identify pictures of parasitic lice, for example, and they're often asserting an identification that really is completely unknowable from the image. It's just not possible. But there's no easy way there's no sort of simple vocabulary with which i can state that the only thing i can do is put them up to the highest level of classification that i feel confident to do is i would imagine in the iNaturalist fora there's probably lots of discussion on this issue but is there any are you aware of any plans to change or tag or make that process simpler because sometimes i don't feel comfortable just putting it up to a higher rank it would be much easier to say, I think that is unknowable based on your, based on the evidence that you've provided. So is there a plan or is there any evidence that you know of in Nine Naturalist to solve that problem? Oh, that is a great question and a great suggestion. Um, and especially I can imagine a scenario where you as an expert go on and put a higher level identification and then somebody comes back and puts a species name on it and then your work is gone in that front. Um, so I don't know of any, I don't, I don't know that. I think this is a great question for folks who work at iNaturalist. Um, and I wonder if that is, if there's a way to kind of integrate a process like that into that curator reviewed um, process that was being discussed in the amphibian and reptile talk, um, where you could over kind of put that higher level identification in as an expert and then kind of lock it into that place. Um, I think that's a great suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, this is Steve Baskoff. And um, some of you were in the late stage task group session the other day, and I talked about our um, the work of the views controlled vocabulary task group, which is just completing its work. And so in a nutshell, we're trying to describe what parts of organisms are present in different organismal groups. And then for those organism parts, what are the possible ways that you could view them? And one of my motivations for being involved in that is to help um, create a way to guide people to what sorts of things they should be taking photos of. So for example, like I, if I were taking pictures of lichens, I wouldn't know like what, is, what parts do they have, a top side, a bottom side? Like, I don't know that. So 
and one of the problems that we had in the task group is that like we developed the um, controlled vocabularies for plants and for fish and for insects, but like we didn't have any lichen people participating in the group. So I think um, it would be great if some of the um, if people who are experts in some of these groups um, would work with us because this is going to be extensible in the future to to say like well what are the what are the controlled vocabulary terms that we should have for these other groups like lichens and then the next step after that would be to like we have the vocabularies available as like json and then another sort of add on on top of that would be to tell people for or different organismal groups what are the features that tend to be taxonomically um, or important for taxonomic identification. So in the end, this could be incorporated in tools that would, you know, I don't know whether iNaturalists would buy into it, but to say like, okay, hey, you're taking a picture of lichens, let's guide you. You, you really need to take a picture of the bottom side of it or whatever. So anyway, I would just encourage people to <laughs> talk to me about this because we, there are many organismal groups we don't have represented in the vocabulary just because we didn't have anybody participating in the development process, And but it's extensible and we'd like to add on these other groups, so. Yeah, um, that's a, a great comment, a great um, idea, and especially because, you know, I think the wonderful thing about, about iNaturalist is that there are so many very keen users of it and if there was a way for them to easily like have in the process like have that feedback of oh you have a lichen actually you know take a closer look this then becomes a learning opportunity for them that at the same time increases the data quality so yeah that's fantastic one thing i could uh, add here is that uh, Somebody else was speaking. Why don't you go ahead? Uh, it's Arthur Chapman here again. Just to follow up from what Steve was saying and, and the question up the back, there are some ways within iNaturalist that we can improve this. For example, uh, the fish people, the, the, the fish people um, have set up um, projects under which all the things can be lumped. So if you set up a lichen pro project, for example, or in the case of yours, a case similarly, you can, um, all the lichens then go into that project automatically and you can set information up at the start of that saying, look, if you're going to take lichens, do this or that, or take this and all those questions that you raised. The other thing is, I wouldn't hesitate in rise, raising it up a level, but just put a comment in there and say, look, I'm an expert studying this, and I suggest that the best we can do is at the family level or genus level or whatever. And people tend to follow that. You'll get the odd one that just wants a number, to identification number. You know, put an elephant in there and you'll get 30 ticks in half an hour. Thank you, Arthur, for, for uh, talking about those options on iNaturalist. I know the iNaturalist team is very uh, keen to improve data quality, uh, but they're very limited by their resources still. Um, to that end, it may be that, um, although they still haven't gotten any funding from US agencies, uh, science agencies, it may be a team of science scientists could propose something that would, in collaboration with iNaturalist, um, that would, um, provide the kind of feedback that we've been talking about. One of the things eBird users may, may uh, know is that when you enter certain species, the software comes back and says, are you sure that number is too large or that's a very rare bird for that? Could you provide more information? And that kind of feedback is certainly possible and would be extremely valuable. So I'm very keen to follow up on uh, some of the ideas that have been suggested here. And if the Tadwig community could engage a, a wide range of taxonomists, one could imagine that um, uh, that you could make it that make this approach very broad. Um, I would be keen for people to uh, talk about uh, 
uh, a couple groups on which to focus to begin with, uh, whether it would be lichens or plants or birds. Uh, one other comment that I think is interesting, and that is that uh, there's a group in the United States uh, that's working on um, a fungi uh, that's a, a community science-based project called Fundus. And there's lots of other fungus groups, but Fundus is particularly interested in uh, community science. And they have followed the, um, the leading effort by the Danish group to have a curated set of uh, observations uh, much in line with what Arthur's talking about. So they 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 know about the people who are pr uh, providing images. They have a curators who regularly talk to people, uh, give feedback, and then they have some quality assurance about the, the images. And that's what iNaturalist needs to make a better automatic ID system. So th the curation process can uh, over time, improve the automatic ID system. It's not a limitation of the software, it seems. It's much more a limitation of the of the training data set. Um, the The Danish um, group has a has a high uh, degree of accuracy from images. Um, so it's possible, perhaps, to improve based on a better training set. We've got questions in the Slack channel, but three minutes still to use them. Did you want me to go through at least a couple of them? Yes. There's one There's one for Henry at the beginning. How do you publish the translations, corrections that you make to help harmonize your data? I'd very much like to reuse your translation list to help better interpret data in other projects. Okay, so that's, <clears throat> that's from Yorit, I think, or, oh, from Steve. Okay, um, so at the moment, <laughs> sorry, so I've been, in, I've been writing to, to Yorit, we've already got a, a meeting plan for next Friday to, to, to look at my data. Um, so the translation that he's talking about is not translation from another language, it's um, when you have one value and you replace it with another value. Um, so it's morphing from one form to another, he wants to know about that. So I've got the original data, I've got the data which I've, um, I've changed, and we're going to be looking at basically how this, this transformation happened. It really depends on the field you're dealing with. Some fields are relatively simple. The longer the text string is, the more complicated that becomes. So um, at the moment, I'm not publishing it anywhere. Um, I've just got in various databases and looking at various comparisons between uh, things, but hopefully I can give a better response to this once Yurit and I have actually looked at the data. Um, at the moment, a lot of it has sort of been, been bulk mass cleaning, um, but not, I haven't really documented this in any detailed fashion, so I suppose that will come out. Um, it's a very vague answer. And there are lots of questions um, for Alex, which he's actually been really good at answering um, on the Slack channel. Um, one that hasn't been answered yet is, is or at least not um, extensively, is, is iSpot data shared to GBIF? So um, Matthew has said, I can't find it, but I realize that it might be shared under a different name. So Michael, if you wanted to respond to that one. Uh, yeah, so it's not yet shared. Um, the, the root, we've got the root sort of, planned in to, to go to the NBN, which is the, the UK system, and then from there to GBIF. I mean, we've got we've got the all the roots and bits and pieces in, in place, but um, it hasn't actually moved yet for, for various issues. I, I, um, I think I mentioned that that's one of the things that hold up is, is the um, those few records that um, I don't know if you, if you, if you remember that, that there was 100, 100 records or so um, which we checked through iRecord, I, I wanted to make sure that there was no, no error. So we didn't send in data that, that could be then someone says that this is not right or it's for whatever reason. So um, it, will, it will go there, but it's not there at the moment. 
Thank you. And then, Alex, because you were asked so many questions, maybe you could choose one to respond to in this session or perhaps add some more information. I wasn't sure I should ask them all. We haven't got time to respond to them all. Um, maybe then if we just sum up, Rob, thank you for a wonderful session. Well, thank you everybody for participating and coming and asking questions. Data quality remains a, a very important issue for biodiversity data. And um, Arthur Chapman and his team have been leading a long-term effort at um, uh, Tadwig to... Uh, tests for data quality. And um, in our session today, we see there are many additional issues that need to be dealt with. And so I expect this uh, uh, research to continue and many voices to contribute. And hopefully people got some ideas today about how they can move forward in their own research uh, agendas. And so I look forward to hearing about wonderful solutions that we develop in the coming years. Thank you very much to everyone.